Well, men, thank you for being present today. I can't think of a more valuable time I, I get to teach God's Word uh, other than Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings than when uh, I'm getting to teach uh, for our men's fraternity because it's so important that men are learning the Bible, being instructed, they're growing in their faith and their knowledge of God. They're learning about how to be a, a better uh, husband or father or uh, personal individual employee, like they're, they're godly at home, godly at work, godly in the church. It's valuable, it's significant in the church. In fact, if, if you believe the statistics about men in church, it's pretty dismal. Uh, by and large, uh, churches in America, uh, fewer men attend churches than women. Uh, men don't read their Bibles. Men don't read books, right? So uh, they, they, they've set church aside. Going to church isn't important. Studying spiritual matters isn't important. The, the statistics, statistics will tell us. And so, of course, we're, we're attempting to fight that trend by what we do with this. Uh, and, and so I'm thankful. I, I just want to say thank you for taking that serious and being part of it. And, and in fact, uh, studying a book called Corporate Worship with a group of men uh, may be causing you and anybody else that would see it to say, have our pastors lost their minds? Like this, is this the subject for men to be studying? Is this what you want to be after? Because usually a church says, well, if men are fleeing the church, how do you get them back? What do you do? And so you host uh, wild game feasts and, and you get motorcycle clubs together, right? You do these things and, and those aren't bad things. They're just not discipleship things. Uh, they're, they're attractional ministries. And so you need some attractional things, uh, but we want to disciple men. And so I value the time and opportunity to teach men, be in front of men, and to help them think about the church. And that's why a book like Corporate Worship, I think is great for men because it's, it's teaching us how do we approach the worship of God. And men should be leading the church to worship God. Men should be leading their families to worship God. So they have to be responsible themselves to be worshipers and do that properly. And then they can show the way to others. And so I, I think it's very significant. Grateful, thankful that you're taking it seriously. And you're here and you're present. So let's think about corporate worship together. And, and I, I just want to start with you today and, and say, have a big view of God. The scripture gives us a big view of God. Uh, the chapter in the book last week really was there. It was talking about don't minimize your view of God. It, it gave the illustration of Niagara Falls. Pastor Tyler talked about walking up on that large airplane and the massiveness of that. And, and, and you see something like Niagara Falls, a natural thing, or you see this hum humongous man-made structure that can lift itself off the ground and fly through the air, and, and you're in awe of that. Well, keep your view of God so big that there's awe in His awesomeness, <laughs> that you actually have awe and reverence for who He is, His power, His uniqueness, His transcendence. Have a big view of God. Worship has to begin with that. If, if we minimize our view of God, then we easily slip into the attitude that I can worship God any way I want to. If I bring Him down in my view, then the rise of my worship only has to go to the level of my mind of what I think of what I want. And so we want to be careful of that. We, we want to move toward those elements of exaltation, edification, evangelism. Right? I'm thankful for his three E's. It helps us remember those words. Uh, but uh, it, it moves us in that direction. Keep a big view of God so that you exalt Him, that, so you edify one another, and so that we have an eye toward the lost world to bring them also to become worshipers of His. And so start there. Have a high view of God. Don't let it get too small, or you begin to think you can worship any way you want to. And, and listen, consider the, the story of the golden calf, and the chapter that you're, you've read for today talks about that story from Exodus chapter 32, uh, where Moses has gone on the mountain. People don't know if he's coming back. Aaron senses the unrest, kind of takes this man-made approach of, well, what are we going to do to keep everybody together? 
Churches think that way sometimes. What are we going to do to keep everybody together? We've got to do something. We're going to lose them. He's thinking that way. And then they build the golden calf. And the problem with the golden calf was not they were worshiping a false god. The problem with the people's idolatry was not the worship of a false god. The problem was that the idolatry was found in this. They were worshiping the true God in the wrong way. Because the statement was, here's the golden calf, let's worship God. They, they, they wanted to make an image out of God, an image of something creaturely. And you can't worship the creature, you have to worship the creator. And you don't even worship the creator by using creaturely images. And so they worshiped in a wrong way. If we don't keep a high view of God, we can fall into those patterns. And that's dangerous. False worship of God, worshiping the true God in the wrong way, is as dangerous as worshiping false gods. And we need to keep that in mind. The, the pragmatism uh, of that thinking, that, that we've got to keep everybody together. We've got to figure out what to do, how to worship God that will fit with what people will be comfortable with so we can worship God is dangerous. And you see that played out in Leviticus chapter 10. And the chapter references the stories of Nadab and Abihu uh, uh, from Leviticus 10. It says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. In other words, Aaron said, There's no argument against that. The true God must be worshipped in his way. He gets to determine what's the right way to worship him. If he's the creator, then the creature is supposed to worship him in the way he prescribes, not in the way the creature wants to worship. So that begins by keeping a high view of God and understanding that the pragmatism of thinking humanly about the approach to worship can be a very dangerous thing. Right? The, the picture of, of that story in Leviticus 10 is very uh, pugnant. Uh, it, it just, you just get the sense of here they come with their fire to worship God and he sends out a fire that consumes them. And Hebrews says that, right? Our God is a consuming fire. Right? Keep that reverence and that awe of him. Have a high view of God. Well, that's what the regulative principle is about. And that's the thrust of chapter 4, uh, is this regulative principle. Uh, what's, what's the regulative principle of worship? How, how, how is worship regulated according to Scripture? And, and the Scripture gives us principles and guidance on, on how we're to worship God. It doesn't necessarily give us every detail of, of all that you do to worship God, but the, the principles are there and the elements are there. And so let's worship God with the correct elements of worship and the right way to worship. And then there's some room to, to say, how do we do some of those things? And, and that takes some wisdom and discernment, and it takes some, uh, some of the context, some of the cultural context that you exist in and live in, right? So um, the, the chapter's trying to help us think through all of that together. So really what it says is this, our instinct to worship God ought to come from a place that says we want to worship God in the way he prescribes. That's really what the principle is trying to tell us. We ought to want to worship God in the way he prescribes. So God, let's look at your word to know how to worship you. That's what the regulative principle is wanting us to do. And it, it argues for a what ought to occur, but not about how every detail is specific. So what are the elements of worship? The chapter says it this way. We tend to use that same kind of, of language that they do when we talk about what are the elements of our ongoing worship services. We want to read the Word. We want to sing the Word. We want to pray the Word. We want to preach the Word. We want to see the Word, right? And, and you see that. We hope you're experiencing that every time you come together to worship at Capitol Hill because we think that ought to be present when we worship, that we, we're reading the Word, we're singing the Word. You don't just sing songs, but you sing songs that speak of the Word. So you read the Word, you sing the Word, you pray the Word. Our prayers ought to be guided by what God's Word says. When we end a prayer, we say, in Jesus' name, we're invoking the fact 
that we have prayed in accordance with what Jesus would say. And so in Jesus' name we pray, right? So we read the word, we sing the word, we pray the word, we preach the word. Why do we preach through books of the Bible? To keep us grounded on the fact that the word will drive the sermon, not the speaker will drive the sermon. And, and then we, we want to see the word. What, is, well, what does that mean? Baptism and the Lord's Supper help us see the word. They bring, they bring the word into a living picture. So those elements should drive our worship. They should be present. Now, it doesn't specify how you read the Word. Do you have to read it all aloud together? We do that on a verse or two weekly at our church, just about. We say it aloud together. But we also read the Word from one person to the congregation. We read it at the beginning by one of our pastors. Somebody else will read the Word sometimes during a, a, a song or between uh, musical elements. It's read at the beginning of a sermon. Okay, so we, we sometimes read the word one person to the congregation. Sometimes we read it aloud together. The Bible doesn't say it has to be one way or the other. We see images of both of those things. So we want to do both of those things. Uh, but it doesn't prescribe necessarily how you must do that, but it does prescribe reading the word. It doesn't prescribe how you sing the word. I've been in churches that uh, are, have a very high uh, church order of service. It's, it's very formalized. Uh, large choir, choir robes, large orchestra, music that's much more anthem driven, more formally driven. I've been in churches in worship settings where it's one guy and a guitar. Uh, there's, there's musical styles that are very different. So it, it doesn't say how you need to sing the word. But the songs that so are selected should reflect the Word of God, the truthfulness of God's Word, no, no matter how they're presented, all right, with instruments, without instruments, okay, uh, formally, very informally, with lots of instruments, with one instrument. Those things, right, get variation. Um, and, and preaching the Word, we go through books of the Bible in an expositional manner. Is that the only way to preach? No. We do it because we think it's a very wise way to go. But you can preach topically and still be expositional. Uh, you can preach on themes uh, and be expositional, be true to the Word of God, right? Be exposing its truth. So th those are just examples of where there's the freedom, but these principles all being there. So when you think about form or style, think about what lends itself best back to those three words from the last chapter the uh, exaltation, the edification, and the evangelistic thrust of the gathering of worship. Pick styles that best, best exemplify, best hold those things up, keep those elements present, present in your context. What, what fits this time period, this group of people, this, this setting, okay? But you keep those things in mind, all right? The other thing that I think the chapter emphasizes and that I kind of want to leave you with is um, if you use this thinking, what ought to be versus what I want it to be, it, it undermines your sense of individualism. And the book's about corporate worship, and the gathering of the church is about corporate worship. <laughs> it, the church is a people who gather to worship Jesus Christ as Lord, right? It's, it's a gathering of individual Christians coming together. So we shouldn't be asking the question, what do I feel like doing to worship God, right? That becomes very individual. What do I feel like doing that I can worship God with? That leads us towards pragmatism. That leads us towards danger. That leads us towards Nadab and Abihu. That leads us towards Aaron. We don't want to ask that question. We should be asking the question, how has God called us to worship Him. How has God spoken in His Word and called us together to worship Him? That's the question we ask. That's why I say this undermines our sense of individualism. When we think about us, when we keep the corporate in corporate worship, when we think about that, we lean into one another and we learn to constrain our liberties in hopes of preferring one another and caring for one another's conscience when it comes to worship so that what we, we do when we worship together would not harm the conscience of an individual coming to worship, that we keep that in mind. Let's worship God in such a way that we could all worship together and honor God, and it wouldn't cause my conscience to feel uncomfortable or cause your conscience to feel uncomfortable. 
So let's find those elements of worship that would prevent that from occurring. Right? So there, there's a lot more that we could discuss in the chapter that you have. I want you to be able to do that. Uh, there's much more to dig into, so I'm going to give you that opportunity. Go dig into that, and let's then come together, be ready to help one another, encourage one another as we corporately worship God.